Uh, thanks, um, Gabriel and the organising committee for inviting me to uh, talk to this uh, conference. It's a shame again that I'm not there. And uh, at this stage when I'm recording this, it's uh, 11 o'clock at night. I was meant to deliver it at four in the morning, but unfortunately I've got to do an urgent procedure tonight. And that's just as a consequence of the COVID lockdown that we're going through over here in Australia. And we've been pretty successful in treating, but unfortunately it looks like uh, we're starting to get the effects of the Delta strain and that's putting a bit of the heebie-jeebies into, the, um, into the hospital system. When Gabriel discussed this as a treatment option for, um, for patients, uh, I wasn't really sure what this was because my Spanish is poor and basically he said as any rescue attempt uh, when you've got uh, an endovascular procedure. So I took that to mean that uh, it's one of those situations where you're at the end of the line and with what options there are from the endovascular point of view when really there's no nothing left, either the patient dies or gets an amputation. So what I'll do is we'll talk to it in, this, in a number of ways, uh, mainly looking at those situations which can be treated with thrombolysis and the techniques of thrombolysis that we've used, or in a situation where there's acute, where there's chronic ischemic limbs and we've got an endovascular option only. So I think just as a background, I'll just briefly talk about the endovascular options. There's a number of options. There's a thrombolysis, there's a thrombectomy, which we do every day, but I'm not talking about those patients. I'm talking about those with extensive scarring that have had a number of uh, thrombolytic procedures or thrombectomies before. So we're looking at two situations where those patients can get thrombolysis either through a mechanical device or a high pressure flow angiojet situation or through thrombolytic, thrombolytic infusions. Uh, and there are some other techniques available which we included in this table, which mainly look at those patients who've got some sort of uh, fresh thrombus which can be aspirated out. So there's a number of devices that are available. I think most of us would be familiar with some of these. Uh, we don't have them of all available in Australia. Obviously, um, I suspect it's the same around the world. So I'll talk to two specific uh, uh, pieces of equipment that we use a fair bit in our practice. First is the AngioJet. Now, we normally use the AngioJet as a mechanical thrombectomy device, and that's very effective in those patients who, have, say, have a reasonably fresh thrombus uh, and in very large lumen vessels where there's, uh, where there's thrombus that can be used. And it's, it's, it's actually quite a simple device uh, to, to use. Uh, once the catheter is in position, the uh, pulse, power pulse delivery system is inserted into the occlusion and then basically the clots dissolves. So in this situation, which is a pretty common occurrence, this gentleman's had radiotherapy for his prostate. He's also had a fempop bypass, which has failed, but we can see the origin of that fempop bypass there. In this person's situation, it was a PTFE graft. It wasn't necessarily a um, vein graft also. We can see the clips from previous surgeries in the groin. So a med thrombectomy is actually quite a tricky procedure. So the use of the endovascular approach is much better in these situations. We know exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, passes the wire, sorry, the wire passes through the occlusion fresh and fresh thrombus quite quickly. There's a, um, uh, the, the catheter is usually parked at the distal external iliac artery. The uh, wires pass, we pass a thrombectomy catheter here. We can see that the bypass graft is open and preserve the runoff. So that's a pretty straightforward situation where we can use at least some sort of thrombolytic event to minimize the degree of surgery that, and open surgery that's done. So if you've got the situation like this gentleman who presents with a history of occluded stents, then what do we do? So in this gentleman, he basically had a previous, he's had a number of procedures. Firstly, he's had a fempop bypass that was occluded. Then we were able to successfully reopen his original superficial femoral artery. That superficial femoral artery was stented. Stenosis occurred more proximally, which were angioplasty. And about 24 hours uh, on discharge, uh, sorry, 24 hours after he um, had an onset of pain, he presented to the emergency department. 
So again, similar scenario, we've punctured the left groin, gone up and over and parked a sheath in the right external iliac artery, a wire has passed through the occlusion, and we can see the thrombus in this particular run. Interestingly, interestingly enough, you can also see retrograde filling of his occluded PTFE graft. So at this stage, there was a fallback option if we weren't able to get across that stent, but, it, but fortunately the stent option proved to be the most uh, easiest to cross. And you can do this. Basically, we're at the stage in the patient's uh, in the is it so at the stage of managing the patient's ischemia that the ischemic symptoms are so severe that the risk of leg loss is high. So we parked the catheter, and then we see that there's existing thrombus. Uh, within the distal end of the uh, superior superficial femoral artery and the proximal popliteal artery. So we decided in this situation to use a thing called the ECOS. Now, the reason the ECOS was in is used was primarily because it was available. In terms of the aims of what we were trying to do, which was revascularize his leg, they're both effective treatments. Well, unfortunately, the ECOS system needs to run over a 24, 12 to 24-hour period and in that situation we really need to consider patients being placed in the high dependency unit or in the ICU. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the ECOS system it's basically a thrombolysis generating uh, it's it, for sorry it enhances thrombolysis by the use of ultrasonic energy waves that basically drive the thrombolytic agent into the clot. It comes in a various size of uh, catheters the catheter size really relates to the length of uh, part of the artery that needs to be treated. We used to use urokinase for it. The difficulty, there's a supply issue at our hospital for urokinase, so I've adopted the use of TPA. The dosage arrangements, essentially, um, we've got a protocol uh, and that's uh, available if you need it, but uh, we try to minimise up to 20 milligrams, I think it is, or 20 mils of the agent uh, maximum uh, usage, but we will infuse a much a smaller amount per hour uh, through a 12 to 24 hour period, depending on the success of the delivery. So in this situation, the man with the occluded stents, you can see the marked catheter. We put it all the way down into the uh, mid popliteal artery. Uh, as this artery, as this catheter extends up, it's parked there, switch it on, 12 hours later, an angiogram, and this is how it looks. So it's a very effective technique of removing fresh thrombus. There are some situations, however, where there is a concern, and this was a significant relationship with this gentleman next, where thrombolysis could in, encourage bleeding. The very complicated uh, vascular path, 45 year old gentleman who has a heavy smoke, a positive family history for cardiovascular disease. He's had a previous open uh, aorta by fem bypass graft that had thrombosed. He's uh, had a uh, number of thrombectomies in both groins to try to reopen that. We did an angiogram previously to try to reopen and include the left external iliac artery, but he developed an occlusion of his left brachial artery. So when we did this procedure, this gentleman had had a three-day history of abdominal pain uh, on the background of three or four week history of deteriorating uh, food in uh, appetite-induced uh, abdominal discomfort. Um, he'd also previously, and this is about four, about two years post-presentation, sorry, yeah, pre-presentation, sorry, uh, he'd had an aorta to superior mesenteric bypass, which had previously been very effective in removing his chronic ischemic, mesenteric ischemic pain. So at the time of the CT, it was obvious that this bypass of thrombose. And at this stage, the only option to remove his pain in the background of likely acute ischemia was uh, to reopen the occluded graft. Now, our concern was major clinically. His CT scan didn't suggest ischemic bowel, but again, the use of thrombolytic agents would be a concern. So we used a machine called a JEDI, which is a, which is a mechanical thrombectomy device. It's incredibly effective and, and quite neat sort of uh, engineering. Uh, the um, a jet essentially of saline is squirted into the clot and mulches it up. There is a sort of limit as to when you can use the clot. So, uh, sorry, when you can use the catheter, the clot necessarily has to be around about uh, up to two to three weeks of age 
which isn't too bad. In some situations, you may need to aid removal of the thrombus by uh, instilling uh, a TPA or another thrombolytic agent into the clot. So in this situation, you can see we've been able to, with uh, much, uh, actually quite simply, it didn't take, wasn't too difficult, insert a catheter into the previously occluded aorta to superior mesenteric graft. It was a six millimeter PTFE graft. And we can see it there, it's reopened uh, with a catheter. Um, the next passage was we used a JEDI, the catheter, unfortunately I can't demonstrate it other than to say it was incredibly effective in removing the small amount of clot. And the great thing about it is the clot disappeared up the catheter instead of disappearing into the distal bowel. We can see, and what we did then is install uh, two small uh, balloon mounted stents based at the proximal and distal anastomosis of the bypass graft. And that technique was very effective in uh, reopening the graft. And it's been very effective in opening up and removing all that excess from us that was existing in the graft. So the gentleman had a great outcome. We can see for a post-op CT scan, the, the aorta SMA bypass graft is widely open. He's got extensive revascularization of his mesenteric vessels. And just for good measure, you can see the clot in the old stent that had previously been done. So what about those situations where you were really at the end of it and patients have got a chronic problem and there is an acute component and you're not convinced that uh, thrombolysis is the way to go. So this is a demonstration of a technique we've been using uh, in this rare situation that happens, but it's just another way you can, uh, you can approach a problem like this. This gentleman's had a previous left below knee amputation and he'd also been treated in our diabetic foot clinic with a, with a right foot ulceration. He'd had a previous PTFE graft that had occluded, that had occluded and then he had a, uh, he, and before that, he had an above knee fempop bypass, which was vain, which had failed. He'd had no obvious uh, superior mesenteric, sorry, superficial femoral artery treatment. And he'd also had multiple redo angioplasties at another hospital at the proximal end of the graft. So he presented to the, to the uh, hospital with his background and also had a previous and had a deterioration in his ischemic breast pain. So when we did the angiogram, we could see that this basically patient had essentially a flush occlusion of, the, uh, of their superficial femoral artery. And the initial plan was to come across, try to, try to interrogate that uh, flush occlusion and try to find whether we could see the origin of the, either the fempop graft that had previously occluded or in this situation, the superior uh, superficial femoral artery. And the runoff gram showed the, showed the middle nipple there, which was equivalent to the distal anastomosis. So in this situation, we can't get through the top of We decided to adopt this approach of going in the popliteal. It's reserved in those situations where we can access a popliteal artery from a medial approach. In this, situ in this, in this case, the patient was lying on their back. We had the hip externally rotated, we're able to uh, get a reasonable good shot of exactly the position of where the popliteal artery was, uh, was in that position. Uh, and you can see that what we've done is we've uh, tried to get a needle and also try to uh, instill and get into that position. Um, it's difficult to get uh, in, real, in, rea in reality in this situation, because you get a heavy amount of scarring at the medial approach, if you use a long 10 millimeter needle and a, mult, a number of attempts, and also to assist this using duplex ultrasound, what you can see is you can see situations where you can interrogate the vein by accident. Uh, and you can see this is three times I've got into the vein, but then, in, but then one time you get into the artery. And you see this situation we've got in the artery, which is indicated by that branch. Once you get into the artery, you're able to pass the catheter into the superficial femoral artery uh, and then put a wire. We, in this situation, we used a, four, a long four French catheter. We put the wire uh, up into the, or the origin of the superficial femoral artery, which gave us uh, a good look at exactly where we were. And at the same time, the most tricky part is reopening at the level of the common femoral artery. Now, if you can see this here, we put a wire in the profundum to protect it. That's, a, that's useful because obviously you don't want a guy to be any worse than he already is. Uh, 
uh, and by occluding both vessels, you're in big trouble. So if you can re-enter at the level of whereabouts where the where the uh, origin of the superficial femoral artery is, it's most uh, advantageous. And we can see after multiple attempts of bloom, we get this appearance, which is a nipple that it really describes the origin of this superficial femoral artery. And this is the origin of the occluded graft. That situation, you pull the catheter in, you pass the catheter down. You can see in this situation, we put a, uh, a Vanchi 2 catheter, which is parked in the distal, sorry, in the proximal popliteal artery, runs off and confirms that we're actually back in the vessel. So it's essentially a guided subintimal angioplasty. Uh, then, uh, then we pass a wire down. And when you remove this sheath from the popliteal artery, what we do is we put a four or five millimeter balloon, which includes the hole that you made in the artery and then continue on with your normal uh, revascularization using stents or and drug eluting balloons or whichever you choose. So essentially what we've discussed is that there's really no open or endovascular intervention, interventions. They're all interventions that are basically part of the same spectrum. Uh, what, I'm, what we're trying to do when we're confronted with these very difficult cases and you're trying to think outside the square is your real aim is to improve perfusion. Now, the best way to do that is multiple. We've got so many tools in our toolkit at the moment where we can use that to get them over this ischemic event and treat them appropriately. Thank you.